Vaart. Hoog u maan. You have a book to read? Which one you want? It's kept. Which is? What do you want to hear? Which part? Maybe we can talk about Krishna Sakhistu Uddhava. Okay. And the stream is all that. Om Nam Timiram Tasya Gnanam Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha in Chaitanya Mano Vishtam Tatyam Nina Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamahyam Dadati Svabhadantikam Vandeham Shri Guru Shri Yudhapada Kamalam Shri Guru Vaishnavam Shri Rupam Sabrajatam Sahagana Raghunathan Vitantam Sajeevam Sarvaitam Sarvadhutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padam Sahagana Lavita Shri Vishakhan Vitaamsha He Krishna Karuna Sindho Dina Bandho Jagatvate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostate Tapta Kanshana Gaurangi Radhe Vrindavaneshwari Vrishabhanu Sute Devi Pranamami Haripriye Vanja Kalupata Rukhyascha Kripa Sindhukya Evacha Patitanam Pavane Pyo Vaishnave Pyo Namo Namaha Jaya Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhara Shiva Sadi Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya 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 Narayanam Namaskritya Naram Chaiva Narottamam Tedim Saraswati Vyasam Tato Jayamadhirayet Nashra Praesho Bhatresho Nityam Bhagavata Sevaya Bhagavati Uttama Shloke Bhaktira Bhavati Naishthiki Krishna Sudhamo Pagate Dhanamakna Nadivhisa Kalaunashta Grishamesha Puranarko Dhunotitaha Grantarad Srimad Bhavatam Ki Jai Is that what you want? No, no, we need to mark this time. Oh. What are you talking about? So you want to hear from... There's a lot of things that Krishna tells to the Deva in the 11th canto. The main point. The main point. <laughs> right now, I don't know. Well, that's basically <laughs> chapter 13 through 31. <laughs> anyway. From that, your favorite verses. Sorry? Your favorite verses from well, the you know, Don't put me on the metal platform. Anyway, chapter 29 is sounds pretty safe. It's entitled Bhakti Yoga. And that begins on page 705. Thinking that the previously described spiritual practice based on detachment is too difficult, that was Jnana Yoga, Uddhava inquired about an easier method. In reply, Lord Sri Krishna gave, a brief, gave brief instructions on devotional service. The fruit of workers and mystic yogis who are bewildered by the illusory energy of the Supreme Personality of Godhead 
and puffed up by their false identifications, refused to take shelter of the lotus feet of the Supreme Lord. But the swan-like men, those who know the, the different, uh, how to d discriminate between the essential and non-essential, always take shelter at the lotus feet of the personality of Godhead. The Supreme Lord himself, within the living entity as the Chaita Guru, and without as the spiritual master who teaches by example, eradicates all the misfortune of the spirit soul and reveals his own personal form. One should execute all duties for the sake of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, keeping one's mind absorbed in Him. One should take advantage of the sacred abodes of the Lord, where His devotees reside. And one should serve the Lord and celebrate the festivals and holidays in His honor, by understanding all living beings to be Lord Krishna's place of residence. One can attain the ability to see equally everywhere, and thus all faulty qualities of envy, false ego, and so on, will be removed. Hearing this, uh, bearing this in mind, the devotee should give up his proud relatives, his separatist outlook, and his mundane embarrassment. Anyone here have mundane embarrassment? You don't have to raise your hand. <laughs> And one should offer obeisances flat on the ground to all, even the dogs and outcasts. As long as one has not learned to see the presence of the Supreme Personality God in all creatures, one must continue to use his body, mind, and speech to worship the Supreme Lord in that manner, of offering full obeisances to all. Because this eternal process of devotional service to the Supreme Lord is transcendental and has been established by the Lord himself, it can never, to the slightest extent, be defeated or proved fruitless. When one offers himself completely to the Supreme Lord with exclusive devotion, the Lord becomes particularly pleased and thus the devotee achieves immortality, becoming qualified to obtain opulence equal to that of the Lord. Anybody know what this is called? When you have opulence equal to the Lord? <clears throat> it's one of five kinds of mukti. And this is called sa huh? sayujimukti. No, sayujimukti means you virtually lose your identity. Sarishti, you have equal opulence. There are five, five different kinds of mukti. Actually, there's more than that, but we talk of five. Sayujya Mukti means to, to identify completely with spirit, but that's a neutral and flat realization. It doesn't satisfy all human uh, characteristics. Then you have Samipya Mukti. You are in the proximity with the Lord. Who has this Samipya Mukti? The, the Pujaris in the temple. They're always in the proximity of the Lord. And Salokya Mukti means you're living on the same planet as the Lord. That means that if you go back to Godhead, then you've achieved Salokya Mukti, when you go back to Vaikuntha, for example. Then you have Sarupya Mukti, and that means you look like the Supreme Lord. Who has this Sa, uh, Sarupya Mukti that looks just like the Supreme Lord? <laughs> Udava himself. <laughs> Udava himself looks just like the Supreme Lord. And all the Vaikuntha residents, in fact, look like this. They all have four arms, yellow garments, jewelry and crown, uh, four arms. Only one difference is that the Lord alone has Srivats on his chest. Jayan Vijay also has I'm sorry? Jayan Vijay also has, yeah. Sorry? Jayan Vijay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, some, you can get more than one mukti at the same time. Right? And what's the other one? So we mentioned Samitya, Salokya, Sarishti, Sarupya, Sayujya. Yeah, so. But above liberation is pure devotional service. I mean, it's assumed that persons living in Vaikuntha, they're also pure devotees. But a, an exclusively pure devotee doesn't want even liberation. Varam Deva Moksham, Namoksha Vatinva, we're going to sing in a month or so. 
Uh, my dear Lord, I don't ask you for any boon, including even liberation, nor even anything beyond liberation. Varam deva moksham na mokshavatim ba na chanham vraneham varesha piha. Even though you're the Lord of all varas, varesha. Just like in near Chennai, we have Varadaja, famous deity who is giver of benedictions. Varaprada, Madhvacharya calls him. So that means Varesha. Nachanyam Vraneham Varesha. I don't pray for anything else from this Varesha. Apiha. What's the next line? Idam te vapur, nata gopala balam. I only want to see this form of gopala. Bala gopala in Vrindavan. That's what I want. Idam te vapur, nata gopala balam. Sada mani, uh, manasi avirastam. What is it? What is the use of any other benediction? I only want this constantly in my heart. Alright? <clears throat> so, after receiving these instructions, Sri Uddhava went to Badrikashram, in pursuance of the Lord's order, and perfectly carrying out the instructions of the Supreme Lord, he attained the Lord's transcendental abode. By faithfully serving these instructions spoken by the personality of Godhead to Uttava, the greatest of devotees, the entire world can become liberated. So it sounds like we're on the right section, doesn't it? Uddhava went back to Godhead and became perfect. I mean, he was already perfect, but he set that example for us. <clears throat> Any questions so far? Is impersonal liberation different from Sayo Jimukti? Very good question. Who knows the answer? Is impersonal liberation different than Sayo Jimukti? We've described it Sayo Jimukti. We've described it actually pretty generally. It means to lose your independence, so to speak. Generally, Sayuja Mukti is understood, at least in Prabhupada's books, Sayuja Mukti is understood to mean we merge into the identification with spirit in, in, a, in the most general sense. Aham Brahmasmi, I'm spirit. And we just we completely absorb ourselves in that meditation. But there's no activity involved in that. There's no affection involved in that. There's no interaction involved with that. There's no reciprocation. There's basically no love, necessarily. <clears throat> now, just for your information, there are other Vaishnava Acharyas who define Sayuja Mukti in slightly different terms. Ramanujacharya Madhvacharya, actually, for example, he says that Sayuja Mukti means that we are so absorbed in devotional service to the Lord that our senses virtually act as functions of the Lord's own senses. We see on behalf of the Supreme Lord, or we move around on behalf of the Supreme Lord. It's almost the concept that Rupa Goswami describes as... Um, what is that word for this? Shakti Avesh. We're empowered to, to act on behalf of the Supreme Lord. So closely are we united with his interest, not united with him literally, but united with his interest in devotional service, that he is prepared to act through us, as it were. So that's another conception of Sayuja Mukti, but it's not the one that Srila Prabhupada generally teaches. Generally, Sayuja Mukti means impersonal liberation. But just as there are different kinds of liberation, there are also different kinds of sayujya. That's the point. Anything else? Shall we go on? Okay. One more question, bro. Oh, one more question. Yeah. So a person can say, I want sayujya mukti without being a mayavadi, right? That's right. If you're in that line. I don't know that where you're going to get that from because Prabhupada doesn't teach that. So you know, maybe the Sri Vaishnavas and the, the, the Mahatmas can, can do like that. <laughs> anyway, there's more we can say about that. But... <clears throat> so, Uddhava says, My dear Lord Achuta, I fear that the method of yoga described by you is very difficult for one who cannot control his mind. 
Therefore, please explain to me in simple terms how someone can more easily execute it. What's the method that he has just described to Uddhava? Remember I mentioned this in the last chapter. It's bhakti yoga. Nope. Last chapter. This chapter is bhakti yoga. Bhakti yoga is the alternative to the last chapter. And Uddhava is saying that what you just described in the last chapter, that's too much for me. It was jnana yoga. Now Uddhava is a jnani. Uddhava is recognized as a disciple of Brihaspati and a great scholar. And Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, jnani tuat maiva me matam. I consider the jnani bhakta to be virtually my very self in Bhagavad Gita. Krishna says a few times that the devotee who is steeped in knowledge is actually the most dear to me. So that's Uddhava for sure. <clears throat> but Uddhava himself is saying, after Krishna instructs him in Gyan, Uddhava is saying, oh, I don't know about this. <laughs> <laughs> so you can imagine, how, who do we think we are if we think we have some Gyan? <laughs> we really don't. I mean, this is an interesting point, actually, if you think about it. And it's not, it's not separate from this idea of Sayuja Mukti. Srila Prabhupada discusses throughout his books that Sayuja Mukti, the notion of merging into the impersonal absolute truth, merging into one's sense of identification with spirit, exclusive identification with Brahma. That is the last snare of Maya, because it's the most attractive thing. It's like, a, it's like a snake that has a jewel on the hood. It's more dangerous than a snake that doesn't have that jewel. Now, why is that so? What is it that's so attractive about this Brahmananda? It's described that if we take the greatest enjoyment of, of the highest and most sophisticated and uh, pious heavenly planets, you can imagine. Even here in Los Angeles, if someone lives in Beverly Hills, that's considered to be a very coveted spot. So what to speak of Svargaloka? But even if you live in Svargaloka, the happiness that is derived when one actually realizes himself as pure spirit, and the, the liberation that that realization entails, that you're, you're immediately freed from all suffering, that is such ecstasy that, that even the demigods cannot imagine it. So if we're not more attracted by that than we are to whatever it is we're attracted by, and nobody has to make any confessions, then it's probably because we just don't have the adhikar to cultivate that kind of gyan. <laughs> Be forewarned. This is not cheap process. <clears throat> but Rupa Goswami says this, Brahmananda, if you multiply that a thousand times, then it doesn't even begin to approach the ecstasy that's derived by the devotees who are rendering pure devotion. Therefore, Uddhava is inquiring about pure devotion. He says, this gyan, I don't know, it looks, actually it's dangerous. Because if we become so absorbed in gyan, and, you know, the gyan, the very nature of this gyan, or Brahma Buddha realization, is that it virtually erases any possibility for bhakti. So if one becomes too much absorbed in that, then it becomes, for a devotee, it becomes a liability. It becomes hellish, actually. Therefore, the Goswami uh, uh, Ashtagam, Sri Vasacharya says, you know, the Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and the six Goswamis, they save us from the devouring mouth of liberation. <laughs> liberation is considered to be like a devouring, you know, like a shark here in the... Uh, here in the Pacific Coast, we have so many people. Now they had big waves the other day, right? So all the surfers are drawn. Uh, but the problem is that there are sharks also because of the nature of what we're doing to our ecosystem worldwide. All the animals are hungry. They, yeah, if they live on land, they don't have any water because there's a drought for so many years. And if they live in the water, the, all their, their, everything is being taken away from them. So what are they going to do? They're going to look for s surfers. Because surfers are wearing these black rubber wetsuits that make them look like seals. <laughs> and it's only after the fact, you know, that, uh, you know, that the shark finds out it's actually not a seal after all. It, it has a very funny taste, you know. What do you say? <laughs> so like that. 
anyway, so this is the idea. So Brahmananda is actually su far superior even to the ecstasy of the heavenly planets, but devotional service is above that. So the humbling fact here that we should take hint from this chapter is that we actually don't know about anything. <laughs> We don't know about devotional service, we don't know about Brahmananda, we don't know about real material happiness of the senses even. All we know is Los Angeles. <laughs> Enough said. So, O Lotus Eyed Lord, generally those yogis who try to steady the mind experience frustration because of their inability to perfect the state of trance. Thus, they weary in their attempt to bring the mind under the control. Purport. Well, before we go to the purport, does this sound familiar? Has anyone ever tried to fix the mind on Krishna? Huh? I think everybody tried on Krishna. Even Arjun tried. And what did he say? Chanchalam himanaha Krishna pramadhi balavadraham. I think it's like. Arjun said it's like trying to control a hurricane. Now there's a big hurricane. Where is it? Off the coast of something. East coast, I think. Um, anyway, so... And if we sit down to try to chant Japa, what are all the things that come into your mind? You know, somebody once asked a yogi, how do I make spiritual advancement? You know, what do I need to do? And he said, you just make note, take stock of all the things that flood into your mind as soon as you sit down and try to chant Japa. That's what you need to work on. <laughs> really, I mean, it's another, another test, I think, is you, know, you can gauge your, the, the, the general state of your subtle body by looking at what you dream about at night. What are you dreaming about at night? You know, that's, that's the general kitchery that our subtle body has become through all the impressions that we put into it stir it up and leave it overnight and it ferments and that's, that's, that's your subtle body <laughs> anyway so Uddhava has also experienced, Arjuna has also experienced it's not so easy to, to stable the mind or to fix the mind on Krishna so what is the key for fixing the mind on Krishna that we need the purport so let's read the purport Without the shelter of the Supreme Lord, the yogi easily becomes discouraged in the difficult task of fixing his mind on the Supreme. So the key is to have shelter. Shelter means an umbrella. An umbrella offers us shelter when it's raining. So what is the meaning of shelter of the umbrella unless it's raining? Who takes an umbrella out when it's not raining? I mean, in India they do, but that's for the sun, which is the same as the rain, in effect. It's an onslaught of some sort. And in life, every day, when we, even before we walk out the door, there's an onslaught as soon as we wake up. Oh yeah, I gotta, I gotta wrestle with this maya again today. <laughs> there's so many things one after another. Just like today, I noticed while we were driving here from Carpinteria, I'm looking at the traffic signs, and for some reason in the right eye alone, there's a big spot in the center of my focus. I don't know what it is. All the words of the traffic signs are just obliterated. I can't see it. I'll have to go to the doctor. It's a new problem. Hmm. Right? This is life. And, and fear. We say, Bhayam Bhutiya Bhidivesha Dasyat. Those who have turned away from Bhagavan and who are cultivating something non-Krishna in their life, something second, they are blessed as a result of that endeavor to turn away from God with the constant companion in the form of fear. When, what is the fear? What are we afraid of? You don't know what the next problem is going to be. You know there's going to be a problem but you don't know what it's going to be. So this is, this is conditional life. Yeah, please. So this, uh, <coughs> this bayan is also a uh, being, Krishna made human being. So to think about him, 
Bhayam is created to think about Krishna, is that what you're asking? For example, if I am scared of something, mm-hmm. and uh, <coughs> generally if you're a small baby, if you're scared of, uh, scared of something, the baby can go to the mom That's right. like that. That's right. uh, similarly, we are an adult, and if I get scared of it, generally we, there is nobody there yet, so we go to Krishna. Yeah. Or whatever the God you think is, they can help us to um, go along and help the bucket of the bayam. That's right. Actually, the real, a thoughtful person can understand bhaya in this world, it only exists, it, I mean, nothing is necessary, ultimately. If there's a God who's created everything, then he's created everything according to his will, and it's not necessary to create a fearful world. <laughs> that means he had some purpose in creating this fear. And, and you've hit the nail on the head. In exactly the same way that the child takes shelter of the parents, the pious person in this world takes shelter of God. And actually even the child taking shelter of the parents, the, the parents are actually surrogates for God. You know, Krishna Mata, Krishna Pita, Pita Aham Asya Jagataha, Krishna says. I am the father of this whole cosmic manifestation. So, this is our actual, our eternal constitutional position is to be part and parcel, dependent servants of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. When we turn away from that, we invite all sorts of problems because that's the way the world is designed. It's called planned obsolescence. It's going to, it's designed not to work. (laughs) Very good point. Okay, so we'll go on. But when we, so when we take shelter of the Supreme Lord, when these onslaughts come, then that is the purpose of human life. We're supposed to think, why am I suffering like this? Why do I need to take shelter of something? If not Krishna, then everybody's taking shelter of something. Why is it that I have to do that? Life is so hellish in the modern world, especially within the last few years. <laughs> have you noticed? I mean, it's so hellish that what are people going to do without God? Without God, there's only a few things that you can do. You can drown yourself in sense gratification. You can kill yourself. You can take intoxication and just try to blow it all off the way that an ostrich sticks its head in the sand. Or rabbits, right? They close their eyes. (laughs) If a hawk is coming down at a rabbit, you know what the rabbit does? He freezes and closes his eyes and pretends that it's not there. (laughs) And that's what we do also. That's exactly what we do. Anyway, so Uddhava is very smart and he's recognizing here that it's not so easy to fix the mind because we actually don't want to fix the mind on God. We want to be God. (laughs) The problem is that we suffer and so it's difficult to do this. So... But the purport tells us that if we have grace, divine grace of God, that that is the shelter. Shelter comes in the form of divine grace. When you approach someone in a raging storm, you approach some house and you beg for shelter, the person doesn't have to open the door. He doesn't have to let you in. This is the point. Even on Facebook, you don't have to... Push later. (laughs) (laughs) Therefore, O lotus eyed Lord of the universe, swan like men happily take shelter of your lotus feet, the source of all transcendental ecstasy. Because mundane ecstasy is very short lived. A few minutes, a few hours, a few years perhaps. You've got in life about 20 years of really active, productive you know, full vigor and vitality, and then it's gone. Then everything starts to deteriorate. Old age means your body starts rotting while you're still in it, and you have to deal with that. And when it gets intolerable, then you die. (laughs) Then you take birth again, and you have to learn the whole thing all over again. When you finally get used to it by the time you're 25 or 30, then you've got, again, you've got 20 or 30 years, 20, you know, 10 or 20 years of, you know, really prime time product, productivity, and then it starts to dwindle again. Why do we have to do this again and again and again? 
And at every step, like I said, every day you walk out the door, you know that there's going to be a challenge of some sort. You may not make it home, especially if you live in Ukraine or other places. <clears throat> so this is life. Actually, it's called, there's a nice word for it, Pavarga. Pavarga. Tamil, you also have the Pavarga, correct? Pavabhama. You must have it. Oh, we have the word. Uh -huh. So, pa means parishram. You've got to work hard. Sharira yatra api chitena prasiddhera karmaha. Inactive, you cannot even maintain your body. What to speak of your family, anybody else's body. You've got to work. Every day you've got to work. Otherwise, you know, the lights go out, the water stops coming, you know, the kids are screaming. <laughs> you've, got to, you've got to hustle. Somehow or other, you've got to do what it takes to make these bills happen. <laughs> That's called parishnam. How hard do you have to work? Very what's, hard. what's the next one? Pa? Pa. What does pa stand for? Pena. <laughs> Pena in Sanskrit means foam. Like a horse. It used to be in the old days, you could take a tanga from Mathura Junction Railway Station to Vrindavan on a tanga. And the horse has to stop halfway to drink water and he's foaming at the mouth because it's hot. And it's hard work pulling passengers with all their baggage to Brindavan. That's called tenor. You have to work practically so hard that you're foaming at the mouth. Is there any such thing in today's society as a 40-hour work week if you even have a permanent job? <laughs> and that doesn't happen either. And we're in the most stable, productive country in the world, practically speaking. Maybe China. Actually, probably China. <laughs> Aside from Dubai and other places. <clears throat> On its way out, but still, you know, still going. Anyway. So, pa, pa. That's parishram, so much so that you feel kena. Ba. What does ba stand for? Anybody remember? I don't remember also. I heard Prabhupada once and said, Vyartha. If you're Bengali, that works. <laughs> it should be Vyartha in Sanskrit. It means, you know, despite your hard work, despite the fact that you're working so hard that you're foaming at the mouth, Vyartha. It's useless. Because at any minute it can be taken away from you. It's, it's, it's peppered with miseries, as we've, as we've been discussing. The threefold miseries of material existence. What's that? Miseries from my own body and mind. Like suddenly I can't see today. I don't know why. <laughs> miseries from other people's bodies and minds. That's a real problem, isn't it? Miseries from fate, like you know, we have drought, or California, we have so many of them, isn't it? We've got mudslides, we've got earthquakes, we've got wildfires, we've got, I mean, so many. <clears throat> and... You know, these, these three miseries are always going on. In case you can tolerate these three miseries, then there's four others on top of that. You've got to take birth, you've got to get old, you've got to get sick once in a while, and you die at the end. That we're getting to that point. So, Bob, Yarsa. Therefore, Bhaya, we've been discussing already, therefore we're afraid. And Ma, what does Ma stand for? Easy to guess. Murutyu. So everybody, you know, we, 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 we come into this life, we figure it out, we're, we're productive for a few years, we start to get old and fall apart, and then you die. Everybody comes up, and then he dies. Another generation comes up, and then they die too. Then the next generation, die, 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 die. <laughs> so what is the point of all this? The point is that it, a, a, a thoughtful person, a pious person, an educated person, will begin to think and say, you know, why? You know. In Mayapur in 1970, maybe it was 76, I, I don't remember. Srila Prabhupada was working at his desk in his office in Mayapur, and there was a bird's nest outside in the hallway on the wall. There was an empty light socket or something, a fuse box, and the birds had moved in. So they were making some noise and they were disturbing Prabhupada. Prabhupada instructed Hari Shari, please, or maybe somebody, I think it was Hari Shari, instructed him, please remove the nest so it was quiet. 
So he took out the bird's nest. The next morning, because Prabhupada used to translate when? When we were all asleep. He would translate maybe from 12 midnight or 1 a.m. all the way until 6. So the next morning when Prabhupada sat down in the still hours to translate, he was hearing the birds again. They're back. He sent the servant out there to figure out that the nest is back again. Somehow or other, they, take, they moved in again, they did it all over again. They take it out again. He took it out for a second time. The next night, Prabhupada sat down to translate. He hears, cheep, cheep. They're back. He sends the servant out there. They don't learn. And Prabhupada said, just see, this is how Maya works. They, they don't understand that there's a person deliberately trying to frustrate all their plans. And in the same way, we have to go through this process of birth, death, old age, disease, suffering in so many ways, onslaughted every minute, foaming at the mouth, wondering what's going on, and then you can't see anything. And we never ask, why? We just, well, this is the way it is. Life's good. <laughs> so, this is the, this, therefore it's called... Pavarga. And the opposite of Pavarga is Apavarga. So how do we get on the Apavarga path? That's described by Kapila Dev to his mother Devahuti in Canto 3, text 25 of the 25th chapter. Anybody know the verse? You should. It's a very important verse. Satam Sangan Mamavirya Samvido Bhavanti in the association of pure devotees, topics about the Supreme Personality of Godhead, they are very, very powerful. And when we hear about these things, that it pleases not only the ear, because Srimad Bhagavatam is such beautiful poetry, but it pleases the heart because we recognize this is true, what I'm hearing. It's what the Kashmir Shaivas call pratyabhijna, recognition. Isn't it? When you have a realization, it's actually something, you're, you're actually a process of, yeah, yeah, I know this, this is right. Isn't it? It's like that. So tat joshana, from the enthusiasm that is generated by that kind of enlightenment and, and bliss, uh, one is very quickly paid, placed upon the path of apavarga, the path beyond this pavarga, beyond the hard work, the foam, the uncertainty, the fear, and ultimately death. And on that path, where do we go? How do we proceed? Shraddha ratir bhaktir anukramishyati. There is a summary. Summary description given by Kapila Dev. There are many, many processes that go on in between Shraddha and Rati. Shraddha means faith. And Rati means, anybody knows what is Rati? Love. It's actually a subdivision of Prema, pure devotional service. So in the beginning we have some faith and we think, let me sit and listen and hear what they have to say. These Hare Krishna people, they may have something that you know, I may benefit from it, right? At least I get, I don't have to cook. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's true. I mean, everybody experiences in the Hare Krishna temple, mostly they show up around the time for the sun. Sometimes they don't even come to the temple, I've seen it. They just line up outside. That's called Annamaya realization. They, they appreciate the absolute truth only in the form of food. <laughs> you have to start somewhere. It's called the yoga after all. But when we take some initial faith and we invest that in good association, what happens? We engage in the process of devotional service. Good association means those devotees will engage us in activities of devotion. And when that happens, what, what's next? Who knows the steps? First is Shraddha, then is Satsanga, 
And then there's Vajrana Kriya. What is a natural result of Vajrana Kriya? Anartha Nivritti. All the misconceptions, all the bad habits, all the illusions, all the attachments, you know, all the suffering, it, it is gradually disintegrated, it's gradually dissolved by the power of this devotional service. Anartha Nivritti said. And when we become fixed, nishta, in this process, that we actually awaken some real taste, ruchi. And that taste matures into an attachment or an addiction to the process of Krishna consciousness called asakti. And when asakti is even further matured, we actually get some real feeling, bhava. And bhava is nothing but the preliminary dawning of pure love of God in which is prema. And prema is subdivided into further stages of which one of them is rati. Therefore, when Kapila Dev says, Shraddha, ratir bhaktir anukramishyati, now anukramishyati means step by step he proceeds from Shraddha all the way through prema. This is all what happens through, especially through devotional service, through good, in a good association. <clears throat> okay, Apsara, you're going to have to behave yourself. <clears throat> Dear infallible Lord, it is not very astonishing that you intimately approach your servants who have taken exclusive shelter of you. After all, during your appearance as Lord Ramchandra, even while great demigods like Brahma were vying to please the effulgent, to place the effulgent tips of their helmets upon the cushion where your lotus feet rested. You displayed special affection for monkeys such as Hanuman, because they had taken exclusive shelter of you. <laughs> Therefore, I'm sitting here today. <laughs> it's only divine grace. Prabhupada is very much like Ramchandra in that way. With an army of monkeys, he set the whole of Lanka upon fire. The whole world is blazing now with Krishna consciousness. <clears throat> Especially in the former Soviet countries, and also in India. That was his plan. He knew very well that really only the Indians have a chance. <laughs> the rest of us are, are what Deva Amrita Swami calls cannon fodder for Lord Chaitanya's Sankirtan movement. <laughs> we're just, we're good for spreading this thing around somehow and getting the idea out there maybe. But the persons who have the real adhikar, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu says, I mean, in some sense, adhikar in that the samskars are still intact there. In another sense, India is actually the worst place for Krishna consciousness. I know because I live there. And I've lost count of the number of NRIs who have told me that had we stayed in India, we never would have become Krishna conscious. It's true. So anyway... Nice realizations that Uddhava is appreciating the Lord's kindness. I'm going to read one more verse and then we'll stop because the children are getting restless. <clears throat> Who then could dare reject you, the very soul, the most dear object of worship and the supreme Lord of all? You, who give all possible perfections to the devotees who take shelter of you. Who could be so ungrateful, knowing the benefits you bestow? Who would reject you and accept something for the sake of material enjoyment which simply leads to forgetfulness of you? And what lack is there for us who are engaged in the service of the dust of your lotus feet? Purport. As stated in the Narayaniya of the Moksha Dharma in Sri Mahabharata, Yavai sadhana sampattihi purusharsa chatushtaye tayavinai tadatnoti Whatever among the four goals of human life can be achieved by various spiritual practices is automatically achieved without such endeavors by the person who has taken shelter of Lord Narayana, the refuge of all persons. Thus, a Krishna conscious person knows that he will obtain all perfection of life simply by surrendering to the devotional service of Lord Krishna. This is the highest stage of yoga as confirmed in Bhagavad Gita. Where is it confirmed in Bhagavad Gita? Highest stage of yoga is bhakti. 
There's a few places, quite a few. One of, end of chapter 6, anybody know the final verse? Yoginam apisarvesham madgate nam taratmana shuddhavan tasate yomam same yukta tamapataha. Krishna says, I consider the, the person who is best engaged to be he who has uh, you know, taken to the, the yogi, the best of the yogis is the person who is worshipping with worshipping me with love and faith. That's the idea. Any questions? <coughs> well, you mentioned about the uh, uh, soul transcending and merging into the absolute common. It sounds, it, it, even though it's like a neutral state, it also it sounds as if uh, it's a, a safe zone where there's also less probability of making offense and falling back. In a sense, yeah, but the predominant brand of impersonalism, you know, impersonal, impersonalism has been globally branded, so to speak, by the Shankara Charger School, and that is an offense. There are many kinds of impersonalists. <clears throat> Even here in Southern California, there are impersonalist groups that are popular, um, but they're not in my life. They respect Sri Krishna as the Supreme Personality of Godhead, or at least as a great personality, at least if they don't say that Krishna is Maya. <laughs> but ultimately the logic of Kevalatvaita, Shankaracharya's philosophy, is that he says that ultimately Krishna's form is, is you know, Sadguna Brahman. It's Brahman, but it, he has this split-level Brahman theory that you know, destroy it's not consistent with his own ideology of exclusive Advaita, but he says that there's a higher Brahman and a lower Brahman. So the higher Brahman is this impersonal reality, the lower Brahman is Krishna. We don't find this anywhere in the Shastra. And it's not logical, nor consistent with the pure Advaita party line. <coughs> so it's a safe zone. It, it's kind of like Buddhism is also, you know, I mean, people take shelter of Buddhism because modern life is so absolutely pungent and, you know, exhausting that they just need some time out. <coughs> and, you know, it's appealing for that reason. And a more spiritually advanced person will appreciate that at least I'm in a spiritual space of time out. I mean, Buddhism, well, what is that? There's, it's an Atman. They don't even believe in the existence of the soul. But, <clears throat> and in, in that sense, you, you can say that, you know, maybe, you know, nothing ventured, nothing gained. <laughs> I mean, you know, but what have you got? You're, you're sitting in stasis artificial stasis, and uh, it won't last. It's like Prabhupada gave the, exact, the analogy, when this cosmonauts were putting their Sputniks into outer space and sputting around the planet with them, um, that one of them was saying that I just am missing Moscow. <laughs> I mean, you're, you're out there in the middle of outer space just going around and around and around, and you're in a little cube. Mm -hmm. And you've got enough crackers to eat, and you've got enough, you know, oxygen for a while. But it's not. What kind of life is that? <laughs> you know. So Brahman, Brahmananda, you know, it's Ananda in the sense of liberation from the suffering. But it's not positive Ananda. That's the point. So there, there is consciousness. Well, well. No, the consciousness is there, but the consciousness is not focused on the ultimate reality. Consciousness is focused on relief, <laughs> which is an artificial state. And it's, it's, it's a static state as well. So Brahma, Brahman realization is static, and Krishna consciousness is ecstatic. That's a big difference. But it's also like an adventure. Anything can happen. Anything can happen. <laughs> we were talking about this. One saint in Vrindavan says that if you want bliss, Worship Lakshmi Narayana. No, no, if you want peace, worship Lakshmi Narayana. If you want bliss, worship Krishna. <laughs> the implication is that if you have bliss, you may not necessarily have peace. It's true. Look at the gopis. Look at Mother Yashoda. I mean, look at anyone in Braj. They're not peaceful, <laughs> but they're very blissful. 
even if that bliss looks like suffering, <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a very deep topic. That one. But the point is that Brahmananda may, may give you release for some time, but how long can you stay in that artificial state? It's very unnatural. And, you know, is it really that good? Therefore, eventually, they, they usually, after some time, they decide that it's not that good after all, and they come back. Either they open up hospitals, or they just go back to sinful activity, or they go back to pious activity, or they, if they're very fortunate, they get mercy from a devotee, and then they can take the bhakti. That's the, that's the best way out of any circumstance. Is that okay? <coughs> Follow up on, on the question. Even an inferior uh, pleasure, like uh, the material, what the material energy is giving us, that's probably keeping me, like for so many billions of years here, I don't know how long. Um, Brahmananda, you said it's, it's much, much, much more higher than... Yeah, therefore it's a big anarta in that respect. This is a good point. It's actually, as I said earlier, it's a liability. Or as I said, it's like a cobra with a jewel on the hood. It's more attractive because you know that it's real. And it is real. That's the appeal of it. When you, when you, when you recognize that it's actually reality, it, it just, it, it's such an infinite attraction there because it's real it's not something false everything else in this temporary world is ephemeral and false ultimately but the the satisfaction yam hina vyatyantyete purusham purusharjapam you know or what is the other one it's not the one I'm thinking of <coughs> Krishna says there is nothing so pure and sublime as transcendental knowledge when, when somebody has transcendental knowledge he, he thinks that there's no greater gain than that until he gets something greater than that. <laughs> and then he knows. You know. When your frame of reference is maya, then Brahmananda is it's infinitely pleasing and pleasing, and therefore it becomes a much harder attachment to give up, which I think is your point. You know. But when your frame of reference is pure devotional service, then there's no comparison. Brahmananda just becomes a, a great threat. This is the thing. Okay? One more question. Yeah. You're talking about gyan, how it's... Uh, I'm probably <coughs> paraphrasing. Like, gyan doesn't really help you to get your devotional service. Or it, it helps you to an extent. Okay, you you need gyan in the form... I mean, to render devotional service in the bodily concept of life, that's called, you know... <coughs> Prakata bhakti, mundane devotion. It's not really pure devotional service because it's mixed with so many illusory considerations. So you can, if you have the mercy of a bona fide sponsor, you can render service in that mode, and that service may be accepted by Krishna. Probably probably only because of the sponsorship of the pure devotee spiritual master it, it, it will be accepted by Krishna. But it's not really, it's not real devotional service. It's, it's devotional service with training wheels um, and devotional service, you know, by dint of your, your good connections. <laughs> you know, real devotional service, Krishna says, Brahma Bhuta Prasnatma Nashochiti Nakanshiti Sama Sarveshu Bhuteshu Mad Bhakti Lavate. When a person gets this Brahma Bhuta Gyan, Brahman realization, when he, when he realizes that he's not the body, that's when you can actually practice real devotional service. So, in that sense, Gyan is indispensable. But after that point, then the Gyan becomes a threat because one is meant to move on. When you're thrown a life preserver, that's not the end of the story. <laughs> it's understood that there's going to be a boat coming to pick you. I mean, that's just going to keep you alive until some, some boat comes to pick you up. It's a tremendous relief if you're drowning, if you're weak and exhausted and, and, and you know, are on the verge of death in the middle of the ocean. A life preserver is <laughs> it's, it's, it's what you need. But that's not... That's not a real life. Nobody spends his life in the ocean with a life preserver just because, you know, it's, it keeps him alive. 
you see what see the point? Yeah, I think it's clear. Anything else? This section of the room is a little quiet. No <laughs> questions here, I guess. Okay. So can you give just a brief <coughs> advice for the younger generation? Probably. Younger generation. What they are supposed to do, how they can take Krishna consciousness in their life. Well, you can chant Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Rama Rama Rama. Do you both chant Hare Krishna? Yes. yes. You chant Mala on the Japa Mala? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. You chant a fixed number of rounds every day? Yes. <laughs> At least one round you're chanting? Yes. Four. Good. Then just, just be patient. Are you reading Prabhupada's books? Yeah. To, no, I, I am. <laughs> to an extent. <laughs> to an extent. He chants and he reads. <laughs> yeah. He chants and then Mela don't chant. Uh -huh. Four, five, now, six, now, and the room and reads. Uh -huh. So one of them is the Gyani Bhakta. <laughs> <laughs> then associate with devotees. That's the main thing. Prabhupada said an association with devotees is 90% is of our advancement. Associating with anyone and anything is 90% of our advancement. Look at your dreams at night. I mentioned this earlier. What are you dreaming about? Well, that's what you're associating with most of the time. Otherwise, how are you dreaming about it? That's what's making the impression. So you find the association that you can relate to. That's an important thing. For young people, they're never going to listen to the old people. <laughs> They've got to find their peers and associate with it. There are so many young people into Krishna consciousness, you just associate with them. The problem is that we live in such an artificially, you know, dissected society that, you know, the only, the, the nearest person under 20 who's chanting Hare Krishna is 50 miles away. I mean, now we have the internet, which is a little bit of a help. You know, it's just a very artificial, uh, you know, arrangement we've made for ourselves to, Actually, we haven't made it. We've sold out to the people who have made it for us. You know, we're all owned by these big, you know, people who incorporate multi. You know, said, somebody said one scholar in Santa Barbara said the new superpower is the transnational corporate class. <laughs> it's not a country anymore. It's a class of people, and, and these are the ones who are arbitrating the, the daily lives of millions of people worldwide, at least in the industrialized world. And you know. They're probably the ones also bombing the people in the non-industrial world. <laughs> but anyway, um, we find the association that we require somehow or other. Seek it out. Either, either take better adv advantage of the association that you have, while you have it, because you won't always have it, or you seek out the association that you don't want and feel you need. Or, you know, if, if all else fails, you can take the really bold approach that Srila Prabhupada took. Srila Prabhupada in the 1950s and early 1960s, he was not tremendously satisfied by his godbrothers because he could see that they were not prepared to fulfill the order of their spiritual master. So what did he do? He went out and created the association that he wanted. <laughs> but that's not for the meek. <laughs> that's, that's a pretty... That's a pretty hard thing to do. But I think the idea is there. That the association is always available, especially in this modern day and age. It's, it's available. It, it may not be physical association. That's just the modern world. But uh, seek and ye shall find. I'm reading books are also some kind of association. Prabhupada. That's right. Association, uh, you know, the word in Sanskrit for association, what is it? Sangha. sangha. What does Sangha mean? Sanggachati. Iti Sangha. The thing, you know, the stuff that all, it all goes together. Sam means all together and gam uh, or gachati means to go. So, you know, Sangha means everything that goes together with your every experience. That means the sights, the sounds, the smells, the touch, the tastes, you know, the people, the place. The language, all of that is Sangha. So we have to figure out a way to take all that stuff and Krishnaize it somehow or other, turn it into Krishna conscious stimuli. And then that's what purifies us. So, you know, the thing is that because personal association means, in a sense, 
spiritual association. The presence of the spirit soul animating a particular body, you know, that's really what attracts us to other people. So it's powerful in that way. Personal association seems to be the most powerful, but other associations are not less important. They're just less powerful. So the, this is a big topic. I mean, all the Shastras have very carefully you know, delineated what to associate with and what not to associate with. Those are all the do's and don'ts in the scriptures. And that, that stuff helps us. But the main thing is to associate with persons who are more Krishna conscious. So I mentioned earlier, sajati ashayas nigta. You have to associate with those who are affectionate, those that you respect, those who, uh, in whom you have faith, those who are more advanced than you, but all in the same way as you. <laughs> Otherwise, you won't be able to relate. And, and that's why I said, for young people, they naturally, they want other young people. Sajatiya. The, the people of the same kind. The, you know, birds of a feather flock together. That's the idea. That's, that's natural. Otherwise, you know, to associate, to force yourself, you know, it's, it's not bad, but it's artificial again. Is that okay? Okay. Okay. All praise to Shri Prabhupada.